Welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, like you, I was listening to the first episode, and I thought we would start with what is high performance, but maybe start with whether anything's different. So you're, when we spoke initially, you said hard work, talent, and a certain type of intelligence represents high performance. Have any of those three changed in the intervening two years since we last spoke? No, um, those, none of those three has changed. And um, re- listening back to it this morning, um, I'm, I was on the bike in the, in the gym. I was pleased I went through it because I was pleased with myself. I thought, no, I still feel like that. It's a good thing. Um, the, uh, there's some add-ons, I think. And it, it's a strange thing, isn't it? I think in, in life and in management, uh, on your job, whatever, I think you, there's this balance of how much do I evolve and change for the better? And how much do I stick to my core beliefs of, of what I think I'm about and what, what gets me there? And then you get affected by, you know, a hundred things, sometimes a hundred things a day as a manager. And um, the, big, the big thing that happened to me, obviously, is I lost my job after speaking to you. And it's funny as well, Damien later on in the, in the episode goes, you know, the, you called it the messy patch or something. You, you talked about my curve and, and you called it. You, it's and coming. You, no, but you and actually said, you said, oh, we've already had that, I think. Do you remember? <laughs> yeah. You went, no, we've, I think we've had the yeah, me- well, messy how middle. Wrong, how wrong was I? <laughs> But um, but that's like that's life, and it's and that's fine. But I think the the one thing I would add to it, and it probably correlates with what what happened in my job there, and probably what I'm sort of working out Everton in different circumstances, is that one thing that there's I I think I said a few things that you can control yourself. I mean, intelligence is not, is, is a weird one, but it's, uh, my point was more work smart, do those things. So the one thing I didn't, which I would add now, is timing, and the uncontrollables which I listen to a lot of your stuff and I listen to a lot of podcasts. Um, and I had a year to do that, actually, out of a job. And, I, I, you know, some of these the podcasts you can come away from and hear great stories of amazing teams, of multiple champions of winners and individual stories, team stories. And I always kind of go, having been in this, the more I live this situation, how perfect is the story, really? Because it sounds great. You know, this person, a great coach, can be telling you about it and... American football, something that I don't know much about in terms of detail. But I'm like, wow, that sounds, what a great idea that was. And he had an incredible environment of players. And they all worked together and they won these things. And then I wondered about how true that is. And sometimes when you're telling a story, you refer back to certain parts. Not, not everything's like this. It's just my feeling. And, I, and my feeling as I came out of it was you have to have timing, which means lots of things, talent, recruitment. Um, and the main thing I've felt is an, an alignment when you're working in team sport and at a club and a, and a corporation, whatever it is, um, there has to be an alignment in terms of the idea. And, and that's something that I think is a huge thing. Now, not everybody has to think exactly the same, but you have to have a vision and a target you want to get to and a basic idea of how you get there. And I think if those things aren't aligned in team sport, I think it's probably hard to get there. And I think we've got some pretty good examples in the Premier League straight away when you look at the evolution of Liverpool and Manchester City Liverpool had a lot of years without winning anything and it seems like that at some point somewhere it happened and probably Jurgen Klopp is a huge part of it but where things changed and, and aligned and, and worked in a direction and we see the results and Manchester City I was lucky enough to have a year there and even though it was before their, 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 their sort of dominations happened with Pep Guardiola I, it, you smelt in the building it was an alignment of this is where we're going to get to and it, and it doesn't matter that we came the year I was there we came second and probably fell below expectations for a club you could see it's no surprise to me that I left because from owner chairman sporting director whatever all the way down through there was something about the place that was going in one place so I think that's a really interesting thing let's delve deeper then into alignment and, and how you get it why it's not there how you can I, I assume what you're saying is there wasn't an alignment at Chelsea culturally between you and them yeah po- possibly and uh, and I'm not um taking away my responsibility because I think you've got to be able to deal with it whatever it is because that's success and success is relative so um you know, there are things that probably I went in and, and again it fascinates me when I, I listen to yourselves and you're talking about um non-negotiables negotiables we spoke about it and we spoke before and my my thing was you have to be able to kind of move on them it's not possible in the workplace to to have this these red lines everywhere and um, so I'm not asking for that. And if there are, if there, if you understand quickly that there are some things that are, are not so important in the bigger picture for this club, but they want results. You maybe have to sort of take your eye away from this perfect image you had of I'm going in here, I'm going to change, you know, our philosophy. I'm going to change the culture. I'm going to change that department because I think that's short. Um, sometimes I think in the big scheme to have that lovely little podcast when you want everything in, a, in an hour of chat. 
there's a, there's a lot of been there before, which is, you know, and probably experience, more experienced coaches than myself or people probably go, yeah, because of that, you shouldn't have come in and focused so much on that. You maybe could have done that. So I'm taking responsibility as well, but I still, in that sort of search to not be, um, to not completely take responsibility or, or give responsibility away, I kind of think, I came away from Chelsea, I think there were some things I was right in my thoughts and how I wanted it to be. And there's some things maybe like I, yeah, but I should have dealt with it slightly differently. Um, to get to the goal, which to get to my goals, which at Chelsea were in year one to do what we did. I think that was success. In the second year, it didn't happen and, and things ended. And then I start reflecting on a few things I thought could have done a bit better there. But I also think that the alignment from the top has to be good if you want sustained success. If you're talking about performance well, that's over an interesting a period of time. Thing, Frank, because I often think that it's an area that doesn't get spoken of. I think what you're touching on doesn't get spoken about enough that when you see a manager fail, that often it'll be a cultural failure mm. because they've come in talking one type of culture mm. and the reality is it's another. So, I mean, there's some fascinating research on this by a couple of guys from Stanford University that they said, traditionally, you put a group of people together, you'll get one of five types of culture. So what Chelsea looks like from the outside looking in is one of those types is an autocratic culture mm. where it's, it was dominated for a long period by one individual, in this mm. case, Abramovich. So, I don't know if you remember when um, Carlo Ancelotti spoke about thunderbolt defeats that came out of the blue mm. would often create a huge amount of uncertainty mm. whether the owner was upset. Mm. You can have a star culture where you go after recruiting like big name players, mm. bringing them in and everything's done to service and keep them happy. Mm. And then you talk about um, a bureaucratic culture, lots of rules and regulations where you have some managers come in laying the law down and engineering culture is where you just prize technical ability over anyone else. So you might go, he's a bit of a dick, but actually he's a good left back or whatever. Yeah. But what you were coming in and talking about on our last interview was the fifth type, which was a commitment culture, which is where alignment happens, where everybody's bought into a really clear sense of purpose. Mm. This is what we're here for. Mm. And a really clear set of behaviors of mm. this is how we're going about doing it. So what I was so when I listened back to the interview, I was thinking you were talking a different language to maybe what the owner was talking or what other people was. So I often find it interesting that when like when it doesn't work, it's often a, a if you view it through a cultural lens, it makes sense why it doesn't work. You know, like if you bring in like a, the example we talk about is take somewhere like Manchester United in the years since Ferguson have been in. They've gone after autocratic managers. Mm. They've had superstars, mm. players. They've had bureaucratic principles of signing. So mm. a lot of the time you see them fighting each other yeah. rather than focused on delivering on the field. Mm. It's, it's so interesting because when I say it, and I'm quite um, quite quick to sort of say this is not talking about necessarily my... I'm, I'm very reflective across the board and I'm... A, you know, Chelsea's a club very close to my heart. So I, talk, I, I think about the era of Roman Abramovich and since I joined. So I'm not talking about my time and, you know, Chelsea didn't align with me. They should have done, you know, and then it would have been perfect. It's not that case because I think it, when I talk about consistency, you probably look at a period of time and go, did Chelsea succeed? Yes, they did because they won, they've won a lot. But is, has there been um, a consistent level probably over the last 10 years in terms of what you would expect in delivery? You could probably question it in terms yeah. of what Manchester City and now Liverpool have both attained. So I think those things are, are really important to look at. And and I, and I, and I wouldn't, I'd, I'd stress not to, when you talk about Roman Abramovich, I think it became slightly different because he, he wasn't, it's not on, he's not on the ground running the club and I think you know like when you have people that are overseeing this place Finch Farm our training ground uh, and Goodison Park and everything that happens every day if you have someone driving that and it aligns underneath that then that's great but sometimes I think we're, with Chelsea it moved away from that the owner's the owner and you complete respect for that obviously and he did amazing things for Chelsea on a, on a footballing level um, but it's more making sure then you have the, the idea of what's the connections down down the line. So it's, it's fine. I, any person can own a football club and not be around. That's the, absolutely their prerogative. It doesn't mean that they don't care. It can be the opposite. But then, OK, well, wh where do they delegate down? What do they, they, they delegate down? And then where do they delegate down to my job, which is coach the team, get results, or, you know, the worst can happen, or you get success. And I think there are just a lot of layers that are behind the scenes there. The, the, they have to be the, the the. It's interesting when you talk about the forms of culture because I think it was it the third or fourth one you said there about having. Um, he's a bit of a dick, but he's a good player. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting one for me because I think as a manager, it's your responsibility definitely to be able to deal with, 
<laughs> bit of a dick kind of yeah, people, yeah. you know, and and probably when I went and I probably had an idea, okay, some things I didn't like behaviorally, I would want to make a point of them and go, no, I want to work to get a group that behaves well, that goes in that direction. And sometimes it's not that simple. Sometimes it's not that simple that you can do that. And if you want to um, change it, you better be sure that you can change it in the right way. And if you're changing the people, you better be sure you can change the people. Yeah. You can't get caught somewhere in the middle. I think, and, th and then you will live or die by your decisions. And so there were certain ones, I won't get into the individuals and the personal nature of it, but I think in my, my learnings and reflections after Chelsea, it was a little bit like, it's very easy to sit there and go, I've got that one wrong. And then another night you can sit there and go, yeah, but if I throw myself back into that situation, this is what I was thinking. And that's great, you just go over it. And there's, and there's not necessarily a wrong and a right. But when I came to Everton uh, and completely different circumstances, it was good that I'd had that experience because I could check myself and go, okay, what's, what's, I always think, what's priorities now? What's, and, and priorities are a huge thing in this job. As much as you have a long-term vision, I need to prioritise the game the next week, the training session the next, what happens, what ha might happen in my squad, an issue that might come up that I don't know. I just have to deal with it. So you can't get too far ahead of yourself. And I think I came away learning, okay, let's prioritise. And when I came into Everton, prioritise was stay in the Premier League and get results. So I, I took no time when I first got it to go, hmm, let me make sure this culture runs brilliantly and we're going to change yeah. the face of this club. Those steps, hopefully, are to come to, yeah. to get to where we want to be. So but it's, it's a really interesting side to get that balance right. And you know, off the back of Chelsea, I did a lot of thinking about that side of things, much more than I did tactics and what my new formation might be where, when I move forward. So when you look back, what would you have done differently? Um, I think... Um, with probably the experience of it, I'm a bit, I, I feel like I'm a bit cooler headed now in terms of, um, in, in probably being at Chelsea was such a place that was close to my heart and I was so desperate to do well that it put, I probably put pressure on myself. So even in our first year, when we came away and I think it's a huge, it felt like a huge success with reflection, top four in year one. But when I was in it, it was like, we must make top four. We cannot be not make, make top four. I'm used to being that as a player. And now it's different. I didn't see that. And so I probably became a little bit on top of myself. And then in the second year, I certainly the, 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 one of the biggest regrets I had was the last period at Chelsea where we came into, out of nowhere, we were second in the league and came into a short run of defeats, which saw me lose my job in the space of a month. From like second in the table to, to I think, ninth the way it went and I think four defeats in the league. And boom, you're gone. But in that period, I was, I was striving to solve 100 problems. And, I, and now, I, I, as I came away, I went, don't get in that position again, Frank. You've got to trust in yourself in those moments. And probably I, I felt what was coming. I felt what was coming, the pressure, the Thunderbolt defeat that Carlo mentioned. And two Thunderbolt defeats is a double Thunderbolt. That's not good news at <laughs> Chelsea. And, and, I, and I probably started to sort of second guess that. And, I, and I, I think that's just experience of life and of this job. And I probably experienced it in, in a pretty cutthroat manner, it felt at the time. But that's what it is. I went into Chelsea with an absolute understanding of, of what it was. It was a club that I loved. And now I just, for the moment, tick it off as a, an amazing experience. That's a lot of good stuff. And, um, and one, hopefully, that, that serves me well as I go forward. But in terms of timing, would you reconsider? So if you had that time again, knowing what you now know about timing, do you think you'd maybe resist taking that job and, and wait? No, no, I would, I would never. I would never do that. I... When I, I, was, I was quite um, thoughtful when I took the job. I, I gave it a lot of time. Um, going from Derby uh, to Chelsea was, a, was, was a, something I absolutely had to do. And, um, and I love the fact that I've, I've done it. I, I don't think about it every day now. I'm very, uh, Christian always laughs at me. I'm very, I block things off. I box them off instantly and move on. And it, I'm, I'm good at doing it. It's quite a good, it's a good skill in this job. And um, so I don't think about it every day now. But I do know that I was... Proud to take the job, proud to get us into the Champions League, proud to get us through the Champions League group in the next year. And I lost the job, and I watched them to go on, go on to win the win the Champions League, which was a real tough one for me because I was like really happy for individuals and the club and the fans are amazing with me from the time I joined till till now and hopefully forever. Um, but the professional side of you goes, oh, you know what I mean? I, I sat there when we we played Seville in um, the last, one of the qualifying group stages games, and we beat them four 0 away. It was beautiful. We played really well. And I remember saying to a couple of the staff, I said, we could win this. We can't win the league this year, Man City and Liverpool, but we could win this with what we have individually in this team if we can get it together. And of course, you know, I had a phase where it didn't go right and I didn't, but I, I, don't, I don't regret anything about taking it. A absolutely not. 
Can I just pick apart a few little bits there? The, f the first one is the, the conversation about culture. So obviously you see Thomas Tuchel come in and go and win the Champions League with the, pretty, the same players in the same football club, with you know, the same senior people above him. So what do you think he did that, that you didn't do then? Or, or did he fit into that culture in a different way to you, maybe? I don't, it's an it's Mate, a d interesting one, isn't it's it? It's really interesting. And um, I've got to be careful here because I can't... Um, I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm being funny about it. I also have just got respect that Thomas Tuchel come in and did really well and I wasn't on the ground at that point. So that's just, that's just what it is. I suppose you, I've become like yourselves. I probably look from the outside and have an opinion uh, and I've got a few ins because I speak to people. So I know some things that felt different. I think the reality is we were a good team um, and I think there were a lot of things that we were doing well. The way we trained, the condition of the team um, and at the end... When it wasn't going so well for those results, Chelsea is a club that very quickly, and it's part of the cultural thing I go back to, very, very quickly goes from really high up in terms of feeling around the place to, oh, hang on, what's happening here? The manager could be under pressure. That's a, it's the nature of the job. And that brings a whole new feeling. And when you consider that you have 25 outfield players, you know, three or four keepers, we might not be playing one of them or an outfield player and those sort of things, that, that environment becomes difficult quickly. Um, so I, I think, you know, it was it was pretty clear to me in the last couple of weeks that we were there and, you know, I was under pressure and that was the way it was. Um, so I think, and this is not to, as I say, with, with Thomas Tuchel, I've got to be very careful. This is not to talk down anything he did, but coming in can be a breath of fresh air, a change, a fresh slate for those 14 that don't play every week. Now they have an opportunity. It looked to me like he managed it incredibly well, incredibly well changed the system. I won't get into the tactical side of it. I played a back three quite a lot. Not always. He went straight to it. I got it. I think that was just good coaching, good idea. He came in and made the change um, and you just have to give him credit for that. But I think probably the, the coming in um, and, the, and the, the way he, he brought a freshness to it, he should just take credit for. And I'm, I'm not, I've got no problem with that. You know, when I say professionally, it was hard. That's not like, that shouldn't sound bitter. It's just, it's I'm totally driven. understandable. I'm just driven. Yeah, of course. You know, and, and I, and I want to do well. And then time absolutely sorts that one out in time because the first few weeks when you're walking around having lost your job uh, or the first couple of weeks after Champions League when people are going, well done, or they're, or they're not behind my back, whatever, they could be saying anything. You kind of think about it all the time. And then another month pass, now I'm at Everton. I don't go there and go, oh, bloody, I wish I'd done that when I was at Chelsea and it wouldn't have turned out that way. I just sit there and go, it's an experience. And I look at Chelsea and I go, okay, the next year, where are they at? Okay, I respect the club. I'm doing my thing. It's completely different. There's a real value, though, in, in realising that things change and how quickly they change, I think, mm. in football, particularly for a manager. Were you taken by surprise? Because I remember, you know, I was covering the games. You'd got to the final of the FA Cup, then you'd had that brilliant run through the group stage of the Champions League, and it felt like it unravelled so quickly. Did it take you by surprise how quickly it went from up there to down there? No. Really? No. I, uh, I knew... The, the, obviously the ownership of Chelsea's changed but I knew when I took the job I kind of knew the premise that it was on um, I think I said to you about timing like the, the stars aligned or something aligned for me to, to get that job and I was very um, I, you know, understanding of that um, but at the same time I knew what that meant and generally managers of Derby for one year don't get the Chelsea job and I felt probably felt like when things might get difficult very quickly they could change I'd probably been a player in that situation too to be fair for a few times um, but I, I didn't see any reason why it would be different in fact I felt I was a, a good fit for Chelsea at the time in terms of the position we're in with the ban I worked hard in that first year we had a relative success never going to get sort of sectioned off as proper success for Chelsea because they've been used to so much and then when we when we made a lot of signings in the summer I knew the expectations were completely changed. I think I said that in the first podcast and they did. And I was under no illusions that it could change. And again, maybe some of that um, was part of me being um, so intense about that club because it was my club. And I, I think maybe sometimes a, a really great manager uh, said to me after I'd lost my job about a month or so later, he said, Frank, he said, us, you, us British managers, he said, we need to change our mindset. He said, we need to start thinking like these foreign managers. And he said it in that way. You know, that's probably a generalisation, obviously. But he said, they move every two or three years. They work hard in a period of time and they're intense or whatever. They're, and they move it and they move on. He said, and then the next one comes along and it doesn't make them any worse a person or worse a coach. It's just so I've, he was probably he was listening to me kind of pour my, not pour my heart out, but talk about it with such passion. And he was probably saying, listen, you know, what's the next one? Go in it a bit more clinical. You know, what do you need to do? 
what do you need to do? And, and, and if it was a case of Thomas Tuchel went, I need to lift this group, and he got some success, and then he had his obviously ta tactical nous to take him to a Champions League final, that's what he needed to do. When I came to Everton, I needed to lift this group. And when we were in a bit of a rut, I needed to change the way we were playing because it wasn't going to get us over the line. And those are just parts of management. And I think it was that the, when the manager said it to me, with experience, I was a bit like, I, I like that. I like that. Probably with Chelsea, I took it so much on and I had this feeling that with a couple of results, I would probably be moving on. It was true. I was half right and I knew that for whatever reason. Um, but it was just part of the of my story there, I suppose. Well, that fits. I mean, one of Alex Ferguson's great premises was that the life cycle of any team is only ever four years. Mm. So he always attributed some of his success to the fact that he could, like the success he'd had afforded him the ability to plan a little bit longer than four years. Mm. So you can get rid of somebody mm. at a certain stage, knowing that you'll probably still be there in four years time. Mm. And so how do you, how do you get, buy-in from above that gets people to sort of see it as a four-year project rather than just that boom and bust cycle of one season wonders? I think you asked me something similar and I couldn't quite answer it last time. I'm probably better versed to answer it now because I've been through that and I've sort of explained it a little bit there. Uh, there's communication is key. And at the end of end of my time at Chelsea, I lost communication with important people above me that I should have tried to keep more. It's one of my reflections on it, because I think then that that void is a, is an issue that just becomes you know the void of like when you don't call your mate for a while and you go I can't call them now. And that's interesting because <laughs> your big thing from that first podcast yeah. was yeah communication yeah. above below. You, yeah. We said you we actually spoke about that phrase losing the dressing room, didn't yeah. we? And you said oh communicate in that situation you need to communicate more than ever, and Absolutely. it sounds like. You yeah. maybe didn't do that. No, and when I listened back this morning, I, I was interested in that, and and it, it certainly wasn't just my fault, by the way, because I think that should be a two-way responsibility because you need to feel support, like you're saying about if you how do you get like a long-term vision? Well, you better be supported back when it is a little bit tough because that's that's the reality of football, unless you're like Liverpool and City winning every game. But let's not forget when those early stages of Liverpool coming here, it was some tough moments, Jurgen Klopp's first year before that, or Pep Guardiola, you know, nothing's perfect. They work through these and they have trust and sometimes the trust comes from their previous work and fair play to them because they can both go, I've done this and done this. I suppose at Chelsea, I didn't have a, a body of work to go, I've done this. So I, I suppose that maybe didn't work for me in that sense. But I'd counter that a little bit, that I think even when you look at someone like Klopp or even like Guardiola, like in their early stages, I think they were still backed, weren't they? Even So you look at someone like Klopp and how he was able to get rid of certain players, even though it hamstrung him in the short term, mm. if the stories are to be believed that they weren't buying into the way he wanted things done or mm. Guardiola getting rid of players at but Barcelona that, that quite comes, early. I agree, that comes back to my first part about timing. Yeah. Because I think, and you know, they're obviously great managers. I'm not going to say they've got their lucky yeah, timing, sure. but I think if you want to make changes for instance your example there about players leaving you have to be able to you have to be able to at the time you won't be able to move players out and people out yeah. at the right time as much as important it is to move people in because if they're not aligned and as I said cultural is a funny thing but you must have non-negotiables you must have an idea and a, and a feeling of the type of person you want in the building the type of play you want in the building yeah. and if you feel that's wrong and you are being backed with it you must be able to get them out uh, or bring ones in that are right and that that has to be aligned so the, the communication thing all the time to, to sell a vision in, in high level Premier League football over four years is not an easy one because I think it's so intense you have to try and do your best to, uh, with it here at Everton at the moment we're we're in, in, a, in a situation that's, that's different for me and every managerial job is different but I came here and it, and it was very clear that straight away we need to fight on a lot of fronts to make this club where we want it to be. And it wasn't just me saying it coming in. A lot of people were saying it, people that care about the club deeply. And it's like, okay, which bit do we go for? So there is an idea of a vision here. And I really hope that we can stick to it through the tough times because they will be here for us. We saw that last year. We were in a, a whisker of going down into the championship. Um, and so we have to just respect that for what it is and go, okay, well, we, we better make some changes. And it's not just about what player we bring in in this window. It's also about every little thing that we do to try and keep to get that long-term thing in that plan to bring it into practice so can i ask you a question about it's an idea a mate of mine did from a different sport was that when he was offered the job as a head coach one of the first things he did before he accepted it was he got the board to so he did what we call pre-mortems 
He said, what are you going to do if I lose 10 games on the bounce? What am I going to do when the players start uh, going to the press about me? What are you going to do when the fans turn on me? Mm -hmm. And he got them to almost identify it before, because he had the idea that you're never more successful than before you, take, before yeah. you play your first game. Yeah. And the board sat there and was saying, oh, we'll be patient, we'll back you. Well, as long as communication's good. So they almost gave him a blueprint of how they were going to deal with it. So he went in not promising success, mm. but he was almost saying, I guarantee there'll be failures along the way and got them to do that so that when they inevitably came, he yeah. almost had that contract with them to say, yeah. you promised you were going to be patient. We knew this had happened. Is that ever possible when you go for like a job like you've got at Everton? that you can have that conversation with the decision makers before you ever take it. Because I get that you're trying to sell yourself for yeah. the job, but there's also got to be an element of realism to it. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think the, the, the idea of it is, um, is a good one and maybe, and maybe a softer version of what you just said, explained there of your friend's story is possible. And I, and I do think probably what way you, what, in what way you're coming into the job, you know, I, I'm guessing again, but a manager that comes in off the back of trophies and can kind of go, well, hang on, what are you going to do if it doesn't work perfectly? And they might go, yeah, well, we trust you and we're with you. I think some jobs, you know, you go into and if you don't feel that strength or that power to be able to sit there and go, hang on, I'm going to interview you a little bit. It's a flip. Um, so what I will say is that you, you do want a good feeling in the room as myself from the, from the other side. So I, I, what I did feel when I came into this job at Everton particularly uh, and I felt actually at Derby when I met that their owner Mel Morris when I first went there was uh, a good feeling, and 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 it means nothing. I didn't ask for that contract, and um, maybe I'll try that one down the line at some stage. But I did get a feeling of of support from from people that were in the room in my interview. In what way? What does that look um, like in tangible yeah, terms? Uh, tangible is not an easy one, but I just felt a feeling of um, um, what's, when I say support. How do I elaborate on that? It, um, there wasn't so much tangible. It was just there were the important people in the room. I don't want to start naming people upstairs at this club, but that that I could feel were really ready to to work with me and see what direction I could take the club in, and were, were quite excited about that, um, and were offering that support, giving off the vibe of that support, and I loved that because, in honesty, when I came to Everton. It felt like a long way from London to Liverpool. Like I'm a Chelsea boy as seen London and it's a club where I looked at had difficulties. The week before I'm going, I'm seeing a bit of unrest and I'm seeing things and, you know, 13, 14 without a win or whatever it was. So there were a lot of things I was putting together. Um, but I, but firstly, I saw this great club, Everton, with an amazing history and what a challenge that is. And then when I met the people that sort of make the decisions at the club, um, and if you read the newspapers, you'd hear a million things about how the club works. I actually was really um, pleased with how they were kind of going, yeah, this is the direction we want to go in. We know where we're at. There's a lot we want to do in a positive way. And there were actually a lot of people that really cared about the football club, which I, which I really liked. And I was like, OK, that, that's that's for me. And and since I've been here, I've found that to be ongoing in, in a short period of time. And, and 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 actually, you know what? I think you you really do need that if you want to be successful, and you can't rely on it forever. Results will always be what you be judged by, and actually how you work every day. But at the moment, I think um, I'm starting to see more that I want to do. I'm starting to feel that support come into action. We may not see it on the pitch in the next three months or six months, but I do hope certainly that we do see it going forward. And I'm I'm certainly all in for that because um, that's how I am. But there are also a lot of people at this club that are all in and. And I'm probably aware that there's some things that have happened here before that we need to get a lot better at. I suppose the first thing, you know, when you, I don't know how it works when you lose your job as a manager, but when you get the news that you're losing your job, how, how quickly do you turn that from a negative into a positive for you personally? How hard is that period? Um, it's, it's a tough period. It's a difficult period. Um, I said I've, it, a lot of people who do my job are very, dri very driven, very passionate. You have a lot of pride in what you do, and, and those things will take a hit. So you do go through that. Kind did of you have the tools to deal with it? Because I, when was the last failure in your life, like on a professional level? No, on a professional level, nothing no. like that. No, nothing like that. And it's big news. It's Chelsea. Yeah. I live at the time, um, barely a mile from Stamford Bridge. 
and it was COVID time, so I couldn't travel anywhere. There's no get out. I love walking the dog, so I walked the dog, and you just feel Chelsea everywhere, and you've just mm. left. You know, the morning I knew I was going in to leave Chelsea, I walked the dog knowing I'd already got the call, the message, can you meet us? I went for an out, and a Chelsea fan stopped me, went, you're doing great, come on, keep going, and all that. I felt like I'd <laughs> wait for breaking news in about an hour and a half, <laughs> and, you'll, and you'll see it differently. So it, like, it's, some parts of it are just practically very difficult. Um, and there's that sort of period of time where it is tough because... You know, if you live your life by it and you're passionate about it and it gets taken away from you, you 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 know, you have to go through a bit of a process. So I did. I did. And I don't know how long it was. I was out of a job for what, a year. Um and you and you do fluctuate a lot from some moments where you get not not ang you get a bit angry, you kinda of go, well, what what could I have done? Why did that person do that? kind of thing and that stuff. You better go over that quite quickly because that's a bit of a nasty sort of cycle, I think. Um and then you get moments where you quite enjoy it. And you go, oh, I'm out of the job. This is great, actually. Settle down a little bit, and I can, you know, go on holiday. I don't have to go to work every day. And for, I'm fortunate enough that I can take stock for a bit. And then you just have sort of, I, I felt this is my experience, just sort of phases of I need to get back in. I need to get back in. Okay, I need to take the right one. Uh, oh, I'm enjoying time on my own. I'm actually enjoying thinking about it. Um, and so it was a period of that, and, and I, I probably went through that cycle nicely. So I was really, really ready to work by the time the Everton job came up. Because we. We exchanged messages about one of the episodes on high performance with Eddie Jones. Mm. And I thought it was really interesting that you said you loved it when you were in work mm. because you could totally relate to what he was saying. But now you said, now I'm out of work. I see it in a slightly different way. Mm. So I'm really interested for people listening to this who maybe are not doing the thing they always want to do mm. or they're in a lull or they're having some, a break or whatever and it's not necessarily their decision to do it. The value of actually stepping back, the value of not being intense all the time. What... What were the big, um, how did that change your mindset? I suppose? It, it changed my mindset a, a little bit in terms of um, balance, life balance. Um, and, I, and I promised myself and I promised my family that when I go back in, I will not have that intensity that I had in the last month at Chelsea. Because wasn't, that wasn't that healthy, if I'm honest, for anybody. And I spent a lot of hours trying to solve problems because that's how I am. But they were they were slightly. Misguided. It also doesn't make you better at your job by being no, intense. No, it, it doesn't. You know, it's an element of it. I like I like intensity. I kind of feel that like it's it's just how I naturally am. But you go beyond the point where it's. I think it's a negative on yourself. In what way do you mean, Frank? Well, so what were your family saying you do differently when in that um, last month? Spending more hours working. Right. Um, so you work, but you know, my sort of day uh, here would be. I try and come in most days and go to the gym. I'm in here at like seven o'clock. I'll do an hour in the gym and then you're straight into the day and sometimes you go, it's five o'clock. Wow. Right. And that's, you know, I'm lucky in that because some of that is enjoyable. Some of that is, you, you know, you're driven and you're doing stuff. Um, so we can be here longer some days. And really and truly at that point, you should go home and put your feet up and be with your family. And at that point, in those period, I would probably go back and do another two or three hours of, you know, sessions, planning, meetings and those things. And and I and I certainly got to a point where I was probably trying to solve too much, and then you you, you probably you know you, you you're draining yourself of energy, and as much as important to get to tomorrow's session, it's also important to bounce into work the next day and be the one that's the happy one. And I had a little period of that at the end of Chelsea, and so I, I was. Were you still enjoying it at the end? No, no, I wasn't enjoying it in the last um, few weeks, and 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 that, and that happened really quickly. So. Um, I really enjoyed my time working as a whole with reflection. I, I sort of I divvy up that last month compared to the period before that was a huge change. Um, but but I have to I have to wear that one and take responsibility for that. There's no one else but me that that was in that position. And I I think if you were to look back and go like your question about should you have taken the job, people go oh, you weren't experienced enough. I don't quite see that. I don't see that. I, I felt that like I was absolutely ready to take that job and I think I proved it in year one. If I look back and go, as I experienced, I go, when it got really tough and you were right under pressure, I'm not sure I would have changed the results, by the way. I still might be sitting here in the same situation, but personally, I went solving every problem and I think that's one thing that I would take back and go, well, Frank, you're not going to solve our um, high press, mid press, low press, goal kicks in, in one day. You're not going to do it. So what do you need to solve right now? Okay, we need to get the mood up. We need to lift it. We need to do so, you know, lots of uh, solutions. And I probably went quite deep in that point. So the original question was almost like in that year out, I kind of got, okay, balance for me, also balance for my family, because that's not nice for them. And as, you, as I get a bit older, I start to think a lot more about that. I start to think, you know, you feel not so much like you'll live forever. And as much as I'm still very driven at work, I start feeling, okay, a month after I left Chelsea, I had a son. 
and you know I actually go wow I'm going to actually be at home with this son and every other uh, child I've had I've been working I drove back from Derby to see you know Patricia to be born to go back and we play Brentford the next day you know and, and so I was sort of blessed in, in that way and then you just start sort of seeing those things and that can change your perspective it's just you're evolving again aren't you I think in a year off even though it wasn't my choice, when I look back on the big scheme of things, I, I might go, actually, yeah, it was important I did that. Have you heard our chats with Johnny Wilkinson? Yeah. Because he would just say, like, explore. Like, explore that period of flying and doing well at Chelsea. Explore that period where, mm. you know, instead of seeing it as a negative, see it as a period of exploration mm. when you were struggling to get your message across or, the, you know, had mm. issues with people below or above you. But equally, explore being at home with your, your newborn son. Like, yeah. In, in a weird way, how can it ever be a bad thing to have been given that period sure. with your boy, which you will never be able to do again? You can't yeah. work for 10 years and then go, oh, now I'm going to spend some time with you and get to know you. because but that, That's why I love listening to other people speak and love listening to your podcast because it takes all types. And the Johnny Wilkinson t um, method or approach is not mine by nature. It's not mine. I, I, I don't want to explore. I want to get back into work and realise what I might have done better. You know, That's my first thing. And really now when I had that year off and I kind of think that I, I start to understand and that's why I like to listen to those things because when Johnny Wilkinson speaks if I'm honest when I listen to that podcast a few things are quite extreme for me and I, I'm not being I'm going fair play that's he's, he's saying it and he believes it and that's for me I'm, I'm going I'm, you know I'm, I'm that's fantastic from his point of view but then you take bits out and you go yeah yeah maybe you know that maybe there's a scale where Johnny's there and I'm there somewhere. Maybe I should meet him somewhere in the middle and explore because I don't, I don't, I, I'm not good at sitting and taking in time and just, I'm always, sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm running for the next thing. And sometimes that explore thing means actually enjoy that period, enjoy it and, and just maybe learn a little bit and take a back seat. So, I'm, I mean, I'm really taken with this idea that, that you've seen your son being born and it's the first time you've had a chance just to be around and, do what a lot of parents would see as natural of having that time to bond and support your wife. Did it make you look back on like the birth of your other children and maybe the quality of life that you'd had? I know you were successful professionally and maybe think that it had taken something from you personally. Um, not, not really, because I just understand it for what it is. And so I've got two older daughters now that are 16 and uh, 15 and 16. And, um, I loved my football career and I was all in on it. So I can't imagine anything in my sort of latter 20s in terms of my professional to personal balance being any different. It was just what it was. Um, and so I, I, I don't think, feel like I, I lost out. My life was that and there were a lot of other things around that that just became um, circumstance of my life. Um, when I had Patricia and I, I'm working with uh, Derby, and if I'm honest, I've never been as settled in my life, personal life, as I am with Christine. We're yeah. so happy with this moment. So it, uh, we did everything we could to make that as perfect as it could be. So it was fine. I joke about the Brentford thing, but it wasn't a problem. You know, I was delighted to get back. I went out, we beat Brentford 3-1. I came back to see it for a couple of days. You know, like life is good enough. I can't complain on those things. And, and I've found, you know, I adore um, all my children. But Patricia, you know, we've had, she's nearly four now. But with Freddie, it was just another version of doing it. And, and as I say, sometimes I have to check myself because I am, I'm in the room, but I'm not there. I do do that because of how I am. I think I'm a thinker, an overthinker. I'm thinking maybe about football, or, you know, my next job or something else. Um, and sometimes someone like listen to Johnny Wilkinson say things like that make me absolutely check myself. And, and my wife, Christine, does it at home. She says to me sometimes, like, she like jokingly would literally say to me, stop thinking about your next job because you know when you're in your next job, you began wouldn't mind going back to that time when I was sitting <laughs> on the sofa and, yeah. and could relax a little bit. And, and she was right. And I, and I kind of started to get there and then I got a job. So does, <laughs> that then, does that then melt away? Because it feels to me like we're having a conversation where you have a little bit more freedom. It almost mm. feels like that first conversation we had, it was mm. like the only way through is intensity. Mm. Whereas now maybe you've seen that there's, a, there's other ways to be successful. Yeah. So does that disappear though once you get back in? Or do you have to fight hard to keep hold of the things that you learned and not let them slip through your fingers? Yeah, you have to fight hard, definitely, because the bubble, this bubble here, and especially the situation I came into, which was a relegation battle, prolonged, a few months, yeah. um, it can easily suck you in. So How do you do that then? Um, I, I, I managed to do it. And I'm not saying now I become this big relaxed manager that comes in and everything's fine. But what I will say is a lot of people, this summer I was away, and I met, met a lot of Evertonians, football fans, and the, the thing they always say, wow, it must have been so much pressure. How tough was that? And it was, but 
it really isn't as pressurised as I felt as the Chelsea manager. And that's all my own doing. That was all my own doing of what, what the Chelsea thing meant to me, how much I wanted to prove, probably that I felt a bit vulnerable about I could lose, you know, expectations. Whereas here, I, I may be just as vulnerable in many other ways. We could have got relegated. But in myself, I was a little bit more like, and I'm not saying I was cool as a cucumber. I wasn't. At Crystal Palace at half-time and 2-0 down, like the writing was on the wall potentially. But I didn't feel that same feeling and I felt a little bit, and it might be 20% from where I was. I'm not saying I've, I've changed, I'm fine. I've been doing another podcast in a year and telling you the new me. <laughs> it's, not, it's not that. But it's just a, a little bit where I've managed to kind of um, find that bit better balance. So even in the tough, tough moments in Everton last year, which were there was much more jeopardy for me here at Everton to, to be the manager that took this club down than it was to, to not make the top four with Chelsea. Yep. You know, economically for the club, for, for me, you know, there was a lot more on it. But personally, in my own world, I was a bit more like, okay, this is the order I've come in. I'm going to prioritise this, this, this. This is what I can do. This is what I can affect. And the biggest thing is I better be a positive influence because we're losing more games than I've ever lost at Chelsea or Derby even. So I had to get reevaluate quickly about how I wanted to approach things. So a few, I mean, you've just touched on an area that I, I spoke to a, a few people in football that that watched with wonder during that period and saying that the only time that they can remember you losing is in semi-finals and in finals and big games and then they're seeing you win, like lose three games on the bounce. Mm. And what they were intrigued looking from outside in was, how are you keeping your energy levels high? How are you managing to keep that optimism mm. despite the fact that it must have been the first time that you've mm. gone through a period like that? So, yeah. so that, what that's... did you do? Um, I, I worked on it. I worked on it. I, um, you're right. It's something I wasn't so used to. Um, you need a lot of support, and when I say that, you need really good staff in the building. My staff are brilliant, and some days you can be the low one. You don't want to show it to the players, but you can be a bit like, you know, we've got beaten yesterday. What's the solution? This game's coming next, and you know, we we, we have to have those conversations in the office behind me. But you better not show that face when you go to the players. And I don't mind saying it out loud because no one's stupid. Everyone understands it. But when, you, when you're when you working with the players, for instance, we lost at Burnley, which was a terrible night for us. Went from 2-1 up to 3-2 down. Put us really under pressure on a Wednesday night. It was raining. It was a tough night. We had Manchester United at 12 o'clock on the, on the Saturday morning, 12.30. And those two days um, were really... The pressure was on. Um, but I, I quickly sort of put my game head on and said right I need to be more than anything I need to be the positive one and the really focused one so that's why I think football and management is never this written you can't have this this uh, this philosophy this project this is how I deal with a season from A to B to C and then we win or whatever it has to be okay you're going to have to compromise you have to change you're going to have to and that's the magic is what, can you feel the moment and for me and that in that two or three days was a really testing time for me because I actually sat here and saw on TV that my job was under threat here. I'd only been here for cutting that came up on the rolling news. I was just about to go and do the media and it came on the news and I was like, oh, great. That's the mindset you want to be in when you've got to go yeah. and speak to the, the, the ones down there. But when I look back and as I say, where I'm better now, I think and I've probably just got a bit better at dealing with it. It didn't throw me off too much. I'm very determined to get What would that have right. done to the old Frank Lampard from... A couple of years before, I think probably I would have, I would have taken it on board in 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 a in a negative way, and mm -hmm. I would have gone into my press conference a bit more, you know, because you know the press they're ready for those moments. They want to test you. Probably would have had a couple more answers for them. Um, maybe my team talk might have felt different. My clarity of thought might have felt felt a little bit different. Um, but here it, it it didn't feel so different. And you see, I'm not saying this is you know listen, we stayed up just. I'm not saying I, I performed these miracles, but it's definitely when you're yourself, you're feeling how you you want you handle these things. You're, there's a realization, and the most important thing in that part is that when you're losing games, you you have to be. If you're not the positive one, and positivity is not always for everyone. You can't come in if a poor performance and be Mr. Happy, but at the same time, you better have a solution or an answer for it. Because if you if you're not positive and you're giving good vibes, and if you haven't got a solution and answer, then I'm not sure what your job is at that point. You got to be you got to be doing something for it. So in in that little two day period, I know that I found a solution for a game plan, and it wasn't just me by the way. That's that's when you need staff, and I've yep. got great staff. Um, uh, the, and we got we you know, we beat Manchester United. That on the Saturday and again not just me the players do it in the end but when I reflect on things you, you know you've you got to look at those things and understand what maybe did get you over the line 
And how did you know what to say? Because this was a very new situation for you. You'd never been in a relegation scrap really as a play. You hadn't been there in at Derby or at Chelsea. Mm. So how did you how did you decide on the messaging for the players? Uh, I went game by game, and that's that was the beautiful challenge of it. it you know, it wasn't always beautiful at the time when you're in the position because they're, they're tough calls. Um, and at some stage, you're literally probably going into a meeting. This is how I was uh, the, the day before a game. Say it was pre Manchester United, or pre Chelsea. These big games that we have to win. And two hours before the meeting, or the night before the meeting, you might not know whether you're going in with a stick to beat them or a carrot to give them. And because you're going, okay, well, what's what's the pluses here? What do I need to say? What's training feel like? What does the room feel like? Do they need me to be the confident one? Come on, lads, you've got it. Don't worry. Or do they need me to go, no, come on, lads, it's time now. Like, And and I, I just went game by game with that. And again, I discuss it with staff, but the decision has to be mine because if you're delivering a meeting, particularly if it's the stick, and I mean the stick, I mean it in a... In a, in a um, uh, practical way. I'm not going, I'm going to go and shout at them because I don't think it's going yeah. to do anything in the modern day, but go, we need to be better at this. You need to be better at that now. And I did that before we played Chelsea. It was a time where I felt that it needs to be a strong chat. In other games, it was more of a, come on, we, you know, we can do this. Be confident. I know you've got, we've got good players in the room. Those are just choices as a manager. There was one occasion when I was watching when the alarm bells went for me, for you, was after that Crystal Palace game where you gave an interview and yeah. you said, you know, I've spent a lot of time sort of kidding some of these players that yeah. they're better than they are and they, now it's time to face reality. Mm. And I was wondering about that tightrope that you walk of sometimes mm. having to having to kid them up and convince mm. somebody they're better than they are. Mm. And again, that, that desire to be really brutally honest and say you're mm. not good enough. Can you tell us about how you walk that tightrope? Um, yeah, and it, it's, there's, there's no written rule. And I remember specifically that, um, post-match against Palace because I felt it one of the good things about it is I think there were positives and negatives to that and potential ones at the time the good thing for me is I felt it and I believed it I, what I said I believed in the the the, the potential negative is, again in this job you have to think about well, okay well, what's the what's the outcome of that what does it mean for me in the workplace um, and I felt that I'd got to a point um, where I'd come in and I would tried a lot of positive talk and I tried to be that positive voice um, and we'd hit a, a, a funny run and uh, a couple of games and I genuinely felt that the players should be better than what they were and I said it out loud and um, I just felt it was time to draw that line and sad and I got I got a little bit of criticism for it saw a few fallouts from it nothing here right with the players um, I felt that the players had got kind of stuck in a little bit of a rut of a tough time and they need, they needed a little bit of a reaction and I felt like it was something that I needed to say I wasn't quite wasn't delighted with my language after I'd said a Said a silly word I shouldn't have said, and Christine said to me, "I got Amsham. Why did you say? Can I, I can say it bollocks." Yeah. I said, mm. "They lack bollocks," yeah. and she was right. And it wasn't exactly what I meant because I know they're good lads who wanted to do well. But I think it was important to. to I felt it was important to say something punchy, and I regretted that side of it. But I didn't regret the tone, right? Generally, okay. And um, and and I, and I think it's also. I, I think a lot about you know when you're a club and when you rely on the fans and our fan base were incredible right through this period. <sighs> If they travel down to London and see the performance they've just seen, am I going, how many times am I going to stand there and go, oh, we're all right, you know, it's all positive and it's all good. So I'm not just doing it for that, but you've got to take all those things into account when you're in this role and say, okay, no, you know what, I'm going to say it because I think the, the few thousand that are driving back down the motorway for five hours are probably thinking it. And so I, when you, you know, did that, did you go back into the dressing room and say to us, this is what I've said and no, this is what I meant? No. no. I never, I never mentioned it again. Right. <laughs> and did they? No, not to right. me. And what was right. the atmosphere like the next time you were... It was an international break. Right. Yeah. So um, it was part of my thinking as well. I, I felt like I wanted to leave it with them. And, and, and as I say, I hadn't been like that. So I, I certainly don't want it to sound like that that was the, the tone that got us through. It wasn't. But um, And I think even after back of the international break, we had a couple of tough results until the turning point came. Um, but but I also sensed the room. I sensed the room of the players, and I, and I, I don't think they were happy with what, what they quite were doing. I came in and I'd, I'd, we'd got a bounce in a, in a short period. Uh, we had a couple of decisions that went against us. One was a big one against Manchester City. It was a deflator because then we went to Tottenham and the bad result. And I could see the players, and that Tottenham night was a bad one for us, and we didn't recover for a bit. And I got to a point where I felt like the players themselves maybe needed that little bit of something a, little, a bit stronger from me. So I just said it. Yep. And then you had that brilliant end to the season where you beat Chelsea. I think you drew the game after that. Um, and then you lost one, but then you had the 
the game that kept you in the Premier beat League. Beat Chelsea, right? beat Leicester, we drew Watford. That's it. Yeah. And then you then, had, we, then we lost to Brentford. Ten men. Which was a horrible one. moment again. <laughs> yeah. Kept you right in it. Yeah. And then you had the the game at home that kept you in the Premier League. Mm. Two 0 down at half time. Yeah. Would you mind sharing with us what that half time was like, how you dealt with it, the conversations that were had? Because I think um again, for people watching this who are not involved in football but need <laughs> to have an impact in the workplace. Mm. These these moments can be difficult. How did you how did you approach it? Yeah, I mean, I, it was one of those where we conceded the second, and it was just shambles of a goal. Uh, around forty minutes, it felt. I can't remember thirty something. So I made a tactical change straight away. I thought it's got to change. We've got to change the look of it. So I changed it. Got more numbers in midfield. We're very stretched at a squad at this point. So there, there weren't that many options for me as as I felt with injuries. A lot of players coming back from injury. Uh, but the lads were digging in, and um, but so I had probably what my point is. I had probably about five minutes of the first half to think about half time, and you and you do, you know, I'm like this is pivotal. This is my job, probably the most important part of your job, I would say. Um, so when I came in, I obviously take a couple of minutes of the staff, and we're all all a bit shell shocked. I'm not going to lie, we're human. Do you know what I mean? It's like wow, it's two 0 here. Um, so my my feeling was it wasn't a, a tactical point. I'd made the tactical change, which I was going to stick with. So um, forget the tactics. Um, and I said this to the players, forget the tactics. We're 4 3 3 now. Uh, change, Delhi, come on. Because here's your moment, Delhi. <laughs> you know, come in and, and he did. He came in and really produced individually. Um, so that was, a, that was a quite easy one for me to, to change a personnel change, to, to inject something. And then I just kind of went on the fact that, lads, there's, there's two choices here. We either carry on and when we, we go down and we've got to go to Arsenal and try and get something. Or we show spirit and understanding what this place can be like when we can change it and we get a goal and then the game changes instantly. And it was it was pure. I said, again, tactics are not important at this point. I can't see anything that's going to change this game. Only you can do it. So I, I, don't, I don't think I'm taking huge credit for that one because absolutely the players did it and the fans did it, by the way. The stadium just, the minute we scored the first one, I'm, I can be sometimes a half a glass half empty man or I might not get a second or they might score another you, you're assessing the game at all points but that was a night where really you go oh something's happening here and then bum bum it happened how, Im how important was it for you to speak directly to the fans which I again watching from afar that felt such a smart move to me I don't want this to come across as being cynical but if at that point the biggest value to you is to get the fans on the side right to make Goodison Park a fortress yeah, it's 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 not. Um, yeah, I don't think it's cynical. I think it's part of your job, and um, there there are, there are so many ways to to do it, and it doesn't all have to be contrived or set up. I think a lot of it has to be natural because fans will see through things, and particularly fans in this part of the world, as far as I see it, they're very very savvy to their football. Evertonians, Liverpool fans, you know, it's it's a football is life. It's their everything, so they don't miss much, you know. So if I if I came in and tried to tell a lie, and that's kind of my point about speaking after Palace, I think a lot of fans will kind of go, yeah, I'll take that if he's going to say what we feel a bit. And I can't guess what they all feel, but I understood that from the place we were in. Um, it was a difficult time when I came in, and it had to change the feeling. And what I did get naturally when I first came in at the club was a positive bounce. So that, that my question marks of London lad coming to, to to manage the club, they, they were sort of, there was a po positive reaction straight away. I was like, great. Um, and then I just felt like I wanted to, for the fans to see how much it meant to me because I am an all-in person, you know, like, and uh, I don't know what you should be. I don't, they shouldn't expect anything different. But my reaction is, I want to be on the pitch after a game if we win, and I want to walk around Goodison and say thanks very much and feel that I get a buzz off that. And but I would also think that I think if I'm a fan, that's what I want to see. Not the old handshake down the tunnel. See you next week. That's important to me. I also realise very quickly as a club of a, of strong, um, in, it's so strong in the community here uh, that it's amazing things we do. By the way, here it's incredible people working behind the scenes. It, it, it rubs off on you the minute you walk in the training ground. How they do that, and and I. I'm I'm not stupid. I saw that and I loved it. And I thought this is this is great. This is how they work. So, you know, little things like meeting the the the, the, the fans clubs, the, the main people in the fans members clubs, and all these things, and going and speaking to them and giving them a bit back, are things that I enjoy doing and things that are important in the in the whole process. And all of a sudden, like, it very quickly, and, and there were some tough times in that period, but we were really good at home at Goodison, which helped. I mean, when you're good in front of the forty odd thousand, that's great um, because they're they're enjoying what they're seeing, and you, and it just started to build. And it wasn't all me. It wasn't 
football genius. It wasn't all thought out. But I tried to just be honest when I spoke in press conferences. I tried to celebrate a win. I tried to be honest about a defeat. I tried to defend the club when we were when I felt we were hard done by with a few decisions. That always goes down well <laughs> with yeah. the fans. But, but don't they just want honesty though from a manager. They just want to be taken on the journey with you. Yeah, and, and so there's the balance though. You have to do that, but you've also got to come to work with these lads. So if you're seen as coming off the game and going, oh, I'm going to give the players a bit of stick here because that's what the fans want to hear. I think you're done. Yeah, yeah. It's, very, it's a very quick end. You can probably criticise the performance. You know, that The players have performed badly today and I think they appreciate that honesty. But th th there's a balance to that. But again, it was, you know, in the time I was here, we, we, we did enough good things and I think the fans saw enough good and Goodison particularly uh, and the fact that, you know, we were all working hard, myself, the staff, the feeling changed very quickly and that, that felt quite natural. And I'm not relying on that forever, by the way, because, you know, you, you can't, you know, be in, you don't want to be seen as, oh, you know, he's great at sort of playing the part, but what's he actually doing? Because yep. that's always the thing you need to do first. But I want to be, I want to be good at both. I want to be, I want people to feel like I'm, in, I'm managing and coaching their football club that they, that they like what I'm trying to do. They like the honesty or you know the, the, the celebrating or whatever. And as long as it's natural and it is for me, it's not, it's not put on. Then I think it's fine. Most of the players are the same. Mm. You're the same. The stadium's the same. The fans are the same. But you've got to make sure your last season isn't recreated. Have you managed to work out why a team with as much talent as this one has ended up in the position that it ended up in and how you stop it happening again? There's, there's talent through the Premier League, yeah. for starters. So I don't think anything should be a given. And I came into the club at a time when it was sort of starting to take course of where we were going to be in the season. And um, we became a big, I think, one of the biggest stories of the potential relegation fight because of our history and because we were Everton and people... We're looking at it and going, wow, here's going to be a story. But I think that was a red herring. I think the reality was we were where we were because that's where we are. You yeah. know, the, the, the league doesn't lie. Um, so, so was it a ta was it talent that had you there, or, or was there something else that needed to be fixed? Um, there, there, there are things that need to be fixed generally. I think. I mean, if you're talking talent, you're talking about how do we improve the squad, the recruitment policy, and all those things. And yeah, we need to look at that, of course, because every team. No team wants to stand still or go backwards, and you know uh, we want to improve that. And now it's my job to be part of the team that makes that better, and that's that's clear. And I've got no qualms in saying that every team will want to improve, and we will look at areas of the squad in balance. We lost five players straight away at the end of the season, we're out of contract or going back on loan. Squad looks different. Okay, where is it balanced? Where is it not? So those are questions. Um, and then the first thing again is, you know, going back to my hard work one, what, what are we going to do about it? To so say, we, you know, we don't bring in players. My job is not there um, to um, cry my eyes out too much about things in here. My job is to work with what I've got uh, and respect. And I'm, I'm happy with the squad we've got. Do I want to make it better? Yes. Do I want to make us better? Yes. Um, but we have to be careful here, I think, with Everton now of where our expectations are. We have to go, OK, we were there for a reason. Let's make a step forward in terms of results and in terms of performance and let's do it together and then let's keep working in, in that direction. And I just see it as that. That's the work now. And you have a very different team around you to the one that you had at Chelsea. Mm. More experience um, in part? Yeah, I think it's, it's really interesting stuff um, how people analyse it and I'm talking about within the game because I'm seen as a young coach so there's a there's some ticks and there's some crosses against that straight away um, and my my assistant um, manager Joe Edwards who I work with at Chelsea is seen as a young coach he's younger than me so there's ticks and crosses the ticks are he's won the Champions League with Chelsea last year he was part of the first team staff he's won everything he could win in the academy at Chelsea all these things so Paul Clement got brought into my staff because he has different ticks and different strengths and and one of them would be experience and for me personally the managerial experience so that's a great little thing on certain little things that come up to sort of speak about Ashley Cole comes in again I'm saying the similar thing but you know we're seen as a young staff there's nothing wrong with that in terms of my staff I think we um we uh, we attack the day every day. We we've all got our strengths, and uh, I respect everybody's strengths within the group. And if they're good at things, then you do it, no problem. Chris Jones is one I haven't mentioned. I've worked with since I started managing at Derby, and I have worked with as a player at Chelsea. Um, so, um, I'm, is it Paul Clements arrived to maybe bring it some experience? Yeah, that, that's great. But um, as I say, there's a few Champions League medals within my team as well. Not to I'm not shouting that from the rooftops, but I I trust in them. Is my point. So how did you decide who was in the new team 
for this job. Um, you have to decide what you think is the the the, the, the team that complements each other the best, that will move forward in the best direction, will support me. Sounds a little bit like you're putting yourself at the top of a tree, but I mean, I suppose you are, because you're the one that lives or dies by it in the end, but support me in the things that I'm not so strong at, need help in, you know, just, you need a team. It's, it's a modern day football team, there's so much to it, you know. You, you could, lots of teams have more staff than what we have. We walked in and Duncan Ferguson was here, he's, he's moved on now, his owner called, and Duncan was brilliant for me in three three months last season. Incredible, I understand it at the club, a different viewpoint to what myself and the staff had in a good way. He could give his opinions on players and all those things. And an icon at the place, legend. So um, th those things are all just there to hopefully complement each other and give you the best chance of success. And you all have to get on. And you all have to have a similar, like we talk about alignment, you don't have to have exactly the same views. It's good to have different views, but you've got to be able to work together. And if you disagree in, in the room about something, you better be able to walk out and be, be mates and be good together after that because this job will challenge you in many different directions and it's good it's good to be challenged and you know but you need people that are not exactly the same as you because then you're bringing different things to the table but if you don't quite agree on something of course the decision has to be sort of seen as mine in the end um but you better walk out and be able to have lunch and we get on great we get on brilliant as a staff so how much time do you spend on that on working on your dynamics and making sure that you as a team as a coaching staff do work great together well, a lot. Some of it's natural, if I'm honest. Um, some of it's natural is that, you know, that they're hardworking lads. They're very aware of what their strengths are and their skills are. Uh, and we, we complement each other. So I haven't found that too difficult. We've just spent a lot of time in the three and a half months to the end of the season that we were here. We all kind of upped and left where we were living, which is predominantly down south. So we ended up sometimes being away from our partners and children. And, I, and I'm, you know, I'm so thankful for the lads to, to do that. It's, and we're, in, we're lucky we're in a good job, but still a pull. We mentioned the family side of it. But we, we end up spending hours in each other's pockets. We'd sit there from, and you have to be careful. Again, it can get to the unhealthy stage. You go around in circles in a difficult moment, but from early till late because our families weren't here. So very, very early in our period together where probably Clem was the new one and Ashley slightly new, it kind of just got together very quickly. And so we spend a lot of time, um, and I think you need to keep reevaluating that. You need to keep making sure you're not wasting time. I think that's an important thing in this job is that you can you can waste time, and it's very important to have real focused roles in what, what you want to do um, so you can be more efficient in your job. So if you look at sort of the, the dynamics of a group that, I mean, there's all kinds of different studies on this. There's some that you describe as, the igniters, the ones that come up with the ideas and why don't we try this or we've got this idea for training. You'll have some that naturally then adapt to that and go, well, this is how practically we can make that brilliant idea happen. And then another group will be your blockers, the ones that will go, it won't work. We've tried this. I, I saw this. Maybe Paul would say, I saw it at Swansea and it didn't work then or this was what went wrong. Who does what for you? Well, I don't like blockers. Because I don't know if it's the way you explain that, but a blocker seeing someone that's blocking and not finding a solution that's different. If it's a, if it's a, a positive blocker, yeah, in a way, and go actually I've seen that, done that, didn't quite work, or someone that kind of questions it in a good way but with an idea to a solution. If you're going to block something, then that'll make your day four days, four hours longer. Yeah. <laughs> so I think we all, as I said before, we all without going into I don't I don't want to not embarrass them or isolate their their qualities sure. all yeah, in yeah. here, but. I have certainly on the positive aspect that the, the, the things you talk about, I have the experience, have been there, seen it, and will, will, will maybe wait their time to give me personally or in the room, give me a viewpoint. Uh, and I've got very proactive people that will see something and go, that's it, that's it. Or after a game and I go home and I, I need a bit of downtime for the night or I'm frustrated watching the game, I've got people in the room in the morning will go, been through it, I think this is the problem. Right, and and I've got good people doing that, which is which, as I say, you need, especially in my job, because you do have sometimes a lot of responsibilities that sometimes you have to be able to find um, a, a structure and a strategy that that allows you not to have to be across everything. Brilliant. We've reached the point of our quick fire questions, Frank. One of these will be different from the first time around. What are your three non-negotiables? Just going to repeat, obviously, I think what I said before. I, I actually didn't get this far on the bike earlier, so I don't know what I said last <laughs> time. You never got to the end of your I did, 50, I did 50 minutes and it was like... I, I was <laughs> that was the best bit the last time. <laughs> well, let's see what they are now then. Uh, 
I don't know. I mean, well, definitely hard work. I mean, I, I that don't was know one of them. Yeah. Say that, and, and yeah. I know that, and I've heard some great ones you've done. And I think generally, like, if you're not going to work hard, how are you going to get to yeah. where you want to be? I think um, uh, respect um, in the workplace, um, having respect for everybody around you, from your teammate, from me and my staff. And it's something I worked hard. I realised that this in this building, particularly at Everton, there are Evertonians everywhere. You know, that's a part of the beauty of the club. It's tattoos everywhere, Everton tattoos on people. And um, I, I realised very quickly, and again, a little bit of a thing from Chelsea. Chelsea felt much bigger in terms of people. It's a bit, a bit smaller here. But you've got to respect everyone in the building because the person, you, your top goal scorer, you may find that yeah, somebody who works in a medical room is just as important to them in a different way. So I think that, that thing is a non-negotiable of having respect across the board. Um, and then the, the, the third one, um, I don't know. I, I don't know. I think there are too many. I, I find it hard. I mean, I could say discipline. But then, I, then I'm sound like I'm running a tight ship, and I, I think in the modern day, don't we want to enjoy the workplace as well? So, you know, I'm, that, that's a balance I'm always trying to find. I'm, that's not really non-negotiable, is it? But I think you're talking about things that are important to you. Yep. Um, and I think discipline's an important thing. But I always remember in my playing days, I don't remember many tactics or many tactical instructions. I remember when I felt good and I enjoyed my work. And so I, I would love the players to be able to feel like that. Happiness. In, in this place, happiness. That's yeah. non-negotiable. Come and there be happy. Go. So next quick fire is, where were you, where are you, and where are you going? Is this a new one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this one's a bit abstract, but I think you'll quite like it. <laughs> you've, got to, you've got to send me these beforehand, surely. <laughs> where were you? Um, when? Like, what, where, where, what do you mean? Well, let's go back to when we last spoke. Where were you yeah. then? Where are you now? And where are you going? Uh, well, where where was I? I was uh, I was at uh, obviously I was at. You don't want me to describe where I was at, and that exactly did. But I was mentally, probably, I was yeah. I was no, I was probably going. If I if I'm honest, I was going into year two at Chelsea, excited, proud to to be managing the club, but also probably in a place at that point where I was a bit like, okay, what's next year going to look like? And it was very different from year one. So probably I knew expectations were going to go through. So I, I would have had some. Um, not fears is the right word, but some, you know, I'd be questioning, okay, where's this going to go? And if you'd have asked me, do you think you'll be, my honest answer, do you think you'll be at Chelsea for the next five years and have a monopoly of Brit I probably would have said, no, not really, I don't see that. So I wouldn't, so that, that would have been a bit of jeopardy for me. I couldn't have given you an answer for when we last spoke. But, you know, I don't want to sound too negative about it because I was in a good place managing Chelsea and we were just about to buy players and near two, it was, so it was pretty good. Where am I now? I think, you, I hope you can probably get it from me. Like, I'm really enjoying my work. Um, so the the only the only thing that now is is difficult for me in any way is when I miss my children and miss Christine if we're not together all the time because I was fortunate to have that for a year, but in terms of the workplace and my determination to do well with at this club, I'm in a really good place. I lo I love coming here to work every day. I love the staff I'm working with. I want to be as good as I can be, so that's a good place for me to be professionally now. Um, and then where where will I where will I get to? Where are you going? Well, I you know we're uh, it's a similar answer to what I just put in terms of you know I want to um, I've come here we've got a new stadium coming here in the next two years I want to be able to manage this club to success and make us better on the pitch take us into a new stadium um, and do as well as I can in the job and then outside of that I want to you know see. Um, my children grow be happy at home and everybody happy and healthy I, I touched on it earlier I really do I think we're all here I don't know everyone in the room but yourself Jack, I know what you how you feel about your children and those things and for me it just gets stronger all the time all my children so that's hopefully they stay well nice what is your greatest strength and what's your biggest weakness I'm resilient I'm resilient I think I found it out in the in some of my work experiences from being a player to being a manager, I'm, I'm very resilient naturally. Um, my weaknesses, um, probably impatient to get to where I want to get to. So I need to, need to work on that one. And the final one, Frank, what's your one final message to live a high performance life? Um, well, I, I think is you have to be, um, very focused on what you what you um, where you want to get to and have a clear idea and vision, and then you have to be ready to 
to move and evolve with that because I think there are there are no simple answers to it. I listen to so many of your podcasts, and everyone gives a really interesting variation of that answer, don't they? Yeah, yeah. And th th so there there isn't one. Every everybody's looks different for whatever relative reason. Like why should if we look at um, the people I keep mentioning, Jurgen Klopp and Pep Guardiola is this incredible because we all see it. It's all there. It's tangible. We go there. They've won this. There's people that are working at so many different levels of sport that are performing re at really high levels in their own world, and it looks completely different. And maybe we don't. They don't even get on our radars. So I think just to stay focused and keep working hard and uh, keep moving in a forward direction. Brilliant. Do you know what? It's so interesting having this conversation now because do you remember in the first episode we spoke a lot about your mum used that phrase, rise above it, mm. Patricia. I think that that's basically what you've learned in that year out is like bad stuff will come your way. Bad moments will happen. Also good things will happen. There'll be great moments. Like to be able to rise above all of it. Don't get too low with the low. Don't get too high with the high. And I think mm. before you were, you did get too low with the low, too high with the high. Mm. It was like you felt like to be really highly strung and almost like restricted by the pressures you put on yourself would mm. get you to a great place. Mm. This hour and a, and a bit, it just feels to me like you've realised that actually rising above it, letting go, exploring, just loosening, not totally, mm. but just loosening a bit just allows you that freedom to, mm. to just be better, I think, and happier, which is important. Yeah, I think it's natural and maybe just through what's happened in that time. And I... I do think that doing this job, um, I probably wanted to be a coach because I wanted to be the best coach I can be. And my idea was that be the best tactician, spend the most time, the most hours, the most this. I want to be. And then I realised when I work with people that people are the most important thing. And when you're a player, you don't have to work with people in that way. You worry about yourself, you're driving, you drive home, da da da, and all that stuff. And then when you become a manager, you go, wow, it's actually 30, 20, 30% tactics, 70, 80% people. And if you're going to be that one that is the low, high, low, intense, constantly, what are you giving off to the people? And I think that's kind of what I've learned. I'm, I'm still searching for perfection. We probably all will in this job. But that, that's kind of been my brief understanding of what you just said there. Can I just ask you another question that I, I, it just occurs to me, like thinking about it, that everything from your whole career, you've all, you, like one of our favourite um, poems somebody told us about was The Man in the Arena. Mm. You've always put yourself in the arena. Mm. And even like as a manager, you know, you speak about the sacrifices of leaving mm. Christine and your children and coming and doing this and mm. the intensity. How do you cope with some of those people that served in the arena for a while while you're a player and now choose not to, but choose to make judgments on you or, <laughs> or, or, or make comments on you? Because yeah. there's a consistency of what you're doing yeah. that maybe isn't applied there. And I'm wondering how you cope with that. I, I think... Um as as I've got more experience in doing this job in the short term, I think I'm better at getting my head around that in terms of, I suppose you're talking about people that are being negative about you, the yeah, players yeah. that are now in the, in the media. Uh, I think you have to accept it and you have to not hang on it too much. Um, but I'll be a liar if I didn't say I looked at it and, and did question sometimes the people that have been in the arena and now make judgments because normally I think they're people that haven't really stepped into the management circle. Yeah, yeah. Because I think, you know, obvious ones that Gary Neville has and Gary's probably one of the most outspoken um, pundits so but when when I know that he's worked in management and I hear sometimes he speaks I can hear that he works in management right um, but I think sometimes people that don't touch it can make statements that are a bit generic a bit reactionary a bit kind of you know casual about you know oh, I can't believe he picked that team uh, I can't believe he dropped that player I can't believe he treated a player like I hear them all the time on the radio or stuff like that and you have to be a bit careful because you can, you can think too much about it. But the reality is when you come and work this side, you realise that all the different things that go on. But that's what occurred to me when you said that realising as a coach, it's about people and mm. getting on board. And like, that's the lessons of somebody that's put themselves in the arena to know that. Yeah. And that, that's why I was wondering about... Yeah, and you have to foul a lot with that. You have to foul. Like I fouled yeah. at different times at Chelsea. I fouled at Derby. And I'm trying not to foul because you will foul. I'm just trying not to foul as much. Because I think when you're dealing with people, if you make a joke about it, probably better off camera. But you say, when you're dealing with people all the time, you better realise that a lot of people are going to give you a problem in some different ways, whether they mean to or not. Yeah, yeah. You know, nobody sees it the same as you. And so I, I think that the dealing with people is one where it's, it's very much trial and error and you definitely get better with the experience of it. And it can be frustrating on the outside if people don't take that into account and just go, why did he pick that team? Yeah, why yeah. Do that? But I think there's an underrated value there. There's actually courage on what you're doing of 
being willing to fail, which is what yeah. being in the arena is all about, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. The good thing is when you do it, and you do it for a while, and maybe you're saying, well, I'm more relaxed having got sacked by Chelsea. The minute I, I left Chelsea, maybe I didn't want to be in the arena for a while, I was like, but then you, you, you reboot, and, you, and, you, and so then you become a little bit tougher every time. You know, I hope they don't keep getting sacked, but you know, like the, the little knocks or the little defeats that you have to, you yeah. hear someone say something about, you care a little bit less because you know that what's important is not what Sanso said on in a reaction who has no idea about what you're doing every day. It means what happens when you come in the next day. And if you love what you do and you get a little bit more secure in that, then you kind of go, well, what does it matter? Don't you still, your ears prick up occasionally, yeah, sure. but you know, it's, um, it is what it is. And I, and I think there's a nice pride to go, yeah, I did have a, a long career. I don't have to do this, but I really, really love doing it. And it challenges you in loads of ways that, that interests me. And so that's probably why I'm here. I'm interested at how, how much now as a manager do you look at tactically, can he do this or can he do that? Or what's his chance as a player? And how much do you, are you looking at now as, is he a good bloke? What sort of character is he? You know, we hear characters probably a lot. When you're now as, as a manager, what's the sort of proportion that you're looking at tactically versus the character 60, 40, 70, 30, tactically, 70, bigger number. Right. So I think what you deliver on the pitch, but the, the 30 or 40 is going to be how they fit in your dressing room, what that might mean. Maybe I should move that back to 50 50 because it's so huge. The problem is, if you're not, sometimes if your budget's what it is, you have to kind of compromise yeah, yeah. a little bit with that. But from working here and from playing for a long time, and, and even more the way the modern game's going with the. The, uh, the riches that are there to be earned, the agents that are on people's shoulders and all these things, if you get the wrong people in, and it doesn't take that many, I think it can be really, really difficult to turn turn the dressing room in the way you want it to. Yep. Um, but, but clubs are doing it, absolutely. You want to bring in the right people. So we touched on this before, but it's, um, can you speak to them? Can you speak to anyone that can give you something on them? Can you have a feeling of, sort of social media, what's their life look like? Um, and that's a huge part of it. Do you do all that or do you have people that do that for Both. you? Both, yeah. We have a recruitment team and if I can help them hands on like that, if I can, and generally because I've been in the game a while, there's generally someone I know yeah. that can give me a reference on that and I, I don't, I'm not on my own in doing that. I think it's a, it's a massive thing. Yeah, I can't, I can't sit here and talk about how people are the most important thing and then say, we don't care what sort of people we have, can I? It's a really, no, no, it's no, a really serious point. And, and if we want, I think it's an issue we have here a little bit at Everton, where, where we're looking at our recruitment over the years. You know, of course, it starts, people look at what, the, the, what you deliver on the pitch, but also you have to look at the big picture, profile, age, family, what they're like, what they're going to produce, what's their impact, what's their investment, what's their, you know, all those things. So if you could, if you could design or recruit the perfect player, what would they look like? Uh, probably about 22, 23 years of age. Um, no, I'm just saying, I'm not, you know, like the young players are great, but you need players that are coming into their prime. Um, uh, obviously, highly talented, that's, that's what we all want, but um, a good teammate and a, and a, and a you know, a hard working, infectious teammate that, right. that wants to be here for the right reasons. You know, leaders come in any way, shape, or form. I don't need them to be pumping their chest. Some players will do that. They just to be, just have to be good, driven players and good lads. Brilliant, love that. Thanks so much for your right. time. Brilliant, thank you. Mate, Cheers. Really, Thanks really for coming up. Great.